Happy New Year, everybody. How are we doing? Good to have you here. Thanks for being with us on this uh, Sunday morning. I'm going to try to make things a little more positive than Gary when he's <laughs> making it feel like the worst year ever. So anyway, uh, no, we are glad that you are here, especially if this is your first time. Thanks for hanging out with us at The Journey today. Uh, you got an email from me this week. We send one out every single week. If you don't have that, you can sign up for it through the QR code that's uh, in front of you. But um, this week I said I got some really big news that I, I want to share with everybody. And so I'll go ahead and share that with you. Uh, as many of you know, we've spent like the last six months trying to fill our associate pastor role. And um, we found a few people. We invited a couple to come check us out. One we offered the position to, and he was like, no. And uh, <laughs> He, he, honestly, he did have an opportunity that he couldn't pass up, so we're excited for him, but kind of left us like, all right, what are we going to do? And we've trusted God in this like, like you can't even imagine. And um, as we were talking and thinking, we're like, there's a name that kind of started to pop up, and it was uh, Joel Pasmino. Uh, Joel comes and fills in and preaches for me uh, frequently when I'm out or got COVID one time and he jumped in on a Saturday's notice. But um, we have offered him an associate pastor role, part-time role for now, about 25 hours a week to be here with us at The Journey. Uh, so he will, uh, he accepted that position this past week. Uh, he will be, yep, we're excited about that. He will be over groups and spiritual formation, uh, pastoral care, and of course he will be on the teaching team too. So uh, he lives in Silver Spring right now. At some point in time, we're hoping to have them move here. Um, but uh, he and his wife Megan, their son Jack, uh, we're excited to have them here. They'll be here next Sunday. Uh, he starts next Sunday, so uh, we're excited for that and to see how God kind of leads us in that. So some big news there, and uh, I'm really excited to have Joel on staff with us. Talking about jobs, I want you to think back to your very first job, okay? Not like the job you got out of college, but like the very first job you've ever had. Uh, maybe that was retail, maybe it was lifeguarding, babysitting, grocery store. My very first job was landscaping. I was uh, 13 years old. Uh, there's a guy in our church had a landscaping company, and so he's like, hey, I need some help on this particular Saturday. Can you help me out? And so I was like, sure, no problem at all. He's like, I'll pay you a little bit. And it's like, that sounds great. So he takes me to this property he's working on, and it's this huge piece of land, and it's just dirt, right? He's, they're putting grass there, and it's all this dirt. And so he's like, hey, I got to get on the tractor and go to the other side and, and work on some stuff there. But here's what I want you to do today. I want you to walk through this dirt. I want you to pick up every rock and stone and uh, branch and root you can find and throw it over into the woods, I'm 13 years old. I think I worked like 30 minutes that day. <laughs> I spent about four hours laying in the back of his truck bed saying, what am I doing? This has got to be the worst job ever. Mind you, I've never had a job before up until that point. But I was like, there can't be anything worse than this. I'm never going to do this again. And then for the next 10 summers, guess who I worked for? <laughs> I did landscaping with this guy and, and kind of loved it to some degree. That's why I don't like doing any landscaping around our house now is because of all those years doing landscaping. <laughs> you think about those first jobs that you had, you learned a lot about yourself, right? You, you learned a lot about other people and of course you learned a lot about life. And here we are so many years later and chances are pretty good you're not still doing the same job that you were doing 10, 20, 30, 50, 60 years ago, right? Where you, you're doing something else. You've done something else with your life. But whatever it is we may be doing now, there's probably this deep connection that we have to our work. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about work. We're in the series called Workology. We're going to do the study of work. We're going to talk through our work and what it looks like for us. And, and today we're going to start by talking about why our work matters to God. But let's start with a, a, a big question that, that maybe you didn't know you were answering, but, but you and I are. And the question is, why? Why do we work? Now, there's many different reasons why we work. There's paying the bills. Uh, I got to pay my bills. I, I need to you know, pay for food, and I, I've got to pay for a place to stay, and I've got to pay for, pay for transportation, and I you know, got some bills to pay, and it's kind of like, I owe, I owe. It's off the work I go, right? Um, we've got to pay the bills, and that's why we work. Maybe for others of us, it's identity. What's like one of the second or third questions we ask everybody we meet? What do you do for a living? 
Why do we ask, what do you do for a living? It's pretty simple. There's an identity to that. And for many of us, that's what we live for. We live for the identity of the work that we do. For others, it's success. We, we want to keep up with our neighbors. We want that promotion. We want those awards. We want that pay increase. And so we just work for success. Still others, it's all about purpose. Now, this isn't entirely a, a bad one, by the way, but, but you have this purpose in your life and you see what you do is good and you're helping people and caring for people and, and it's important to you. But as we look through this, this list, the reality is nowhere in Scripture does it say these are the four things that you need to work for, which means there must be something more to the work that we do. And, and there's got to be a reason that that work actually matters to God. Well, how do we know this is true? Well, we're going to go back to the very beginning, like the literal beginning. We're going to go back to the creation story with Adam and Eve. And in Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 26, we read this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So here we have God, God has created the world and God has created humans. And then if you look at these humans, do you see what their job is? Like they are the CEO of the world at that time, right? God, God has told them, here's the deal. You are in charge. You get to rule over the land. You get to reign over the animals. Now, the pay is not very good because you're not going to get paid at all for this. But think about it. You get to hang out in this amazing, beautiful garden for as long as you want. And you get to hang out with me. I, I read this passage here. In Genesis chapter 1, and I think work hasn't always been a grind, has it? Because this sounds like a pretty sweet gig, but there is a key point to this. If you go back and you look at that, Adam and Eve, they have to work. All right, again, our image of Adam and Eve in the garden is they're laying around in hammocks all day, drinking Mai Tais. There's angels around just popping grapes in their mouth whenever they want it, like... This is like the best inclusive resort you could ever be a part of. But that's not what it is. God's like, hey, you're here, and I've got work for you to do. Now, of course, something changes if you know the story. The serpent shows up, pretty cunning character in all of this, and has this conversation, and it really changes this, this mindset that these humans had and, and what God had asked them to do. In fact, it's the first theological conversation we actually have in Scripture because the serpent's been studying God and, and comes to them and says, hey, let me tell you a few things about God. Like God doesn't want you to know certain things. God doesn't want you to know the same things that God knows. And so God's trying to keep you down. God's trying to oppress you and you can get out of that oppression by eating this fruit. Well, what happens here? Go to Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 6. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then, excuse me, she gave some to her husband who was with her and he, he ate it too. So we have Eve. Uh, she's persuaded that the fruit is, should, is something that, that they should eat. And so she eats it. But, but also notice there it says she gave some to her husband who was with her. Right? This is another image we have of the story that, that Eve's by herself, kind of hanging out. Adam's out playing golf for the day. He comes back home, and Eve's like, man, I got some new fruit for you. This is going to be amazing. You should really try this. I really liked it. And, and, and then Adam decided to eat it. That, that's not the case at all. He's right there with her. And, and he doesn't say, well, hold up, hon. Let's, let's talk through this. Can we have a conversation? You know, I don't, I don't think this is the best step for us. None of that takes place here. Adam is with Eve. They decide to eat the fruit, and they do it. Well, as you know the story, God tells them, hey, if you eat from this tree, if you eat from this fruit, you're going to be punished. 
If you look at the rest of chapter 3, we get to read some of those punishments. But I'm going to look at one particular part out of verse 17. It says, And to the man, he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. There's a survey that was done recently and found that 46% of U.S. workers said they wouldn't wish their job on their worst enemy. 53% of global employees would choose a different profession than they are currently in. 40% of global employees wish someone had warned them not to take the job that they have right now at this moment. Nearly two-thirds would switch their job right now if they could. You and I last in a job for about 4.4 years before we move on. Over the course of a lifetime, we hold about 12 different jobs. It sounds like we love our work, don't we? Like it's the best thing in the world. I mean, nothing can be better than our work. And and we read something like we read here in verse 17, and we're like, but this is why my work stinks. This is why I don't like what I do, because Adam and Eve couldn't obey God, right? It's their fault. Like they were in the penthouse, and now they're in the outhouse. They were in the boardroom, and now they're in the mail room. They had it all. And what did they do? They, they messed it up for us. And so here I am today, and this is why I hate the work that I do. But I want you to look carefully at the words here. It doesn't say that God curses the work. In fact, if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, it looks like God says, hey, you know what you need to do? You need to work. And you know what you need to do? You need to be productive. You need to keep yourself going and busy and, and doing something with yourself. But, but what does God actually curse here? God curses the ground. So if God curses the ground and God didn't curse the work, why do I hate my job? Why can't I stand the people I work with? Why is it on a Sunday evening I start to get hives thinking about Monday morning and what's coming? Why is it we seem to be so unhappy with the work that we do? I think it goes back to what I said earlier. It's our view of work. It's how we view the work that we do. We look at our work and like, hey, I'm just, I'm just working to pay my bills. I'm just working because of this identity it gives me. I'm just working for success. I'm just working for the, this purpose. And we really don't understand or see why our work is so important and why, in the end, it matters to God. Time of Jesus, there were rules within households, and many of those rules were secular in nature. And if you read some of Paul's writings in the New Testament, those letters he wrote, he, he talks about these household rules. And he talks about the importance of, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus, you, you should live out these rules in those house. Because how you respond to those rules says a lot about your faith. And not only does it say a lot about your faith, but how you respond to those rules tells a, a lot about your faith when it comes to how people see you and how they see Jesus in their own lives. There's, there's this power to influence other people's lives. In the book of Colossians, which again is, is a letter Paul writes, he's talking about these household rules and he's talking about slaves and, and masters. Now, I know when we hear the word slaves, we, we go to a Civil War area here in the, the United States. And, and in Paul's day, there was some of that kind of slavery, but, but it was also very different, too. Um, for instance, uh, you would find that, that many times in homes, um, slaves were some of the best educated. And uh, they were working as doctors. They were working as, as teachers there in those homes. They, they were really important to the, the roles in society. But again, I know it's hard for us to divorce from, from that word slavery that we're so used to from what we read here. But you gotta understand in Paul's day, uh, slaves were the dominant workforce in the Roman Empire. Jobs that we do today, that we do for 40 hours a week, the, these were jobs that slaves would have held in, in those days, again, in that empire. And, and so as Paul is talking here about slaves and masters, he's talking about workers and bosses is what he's, what he's talking about. But, but what does Paul specifically say about work? When Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, we read this. 
Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. So here's Paul who's saying, hey, the way you need to live your life when it comes to your work is with incredible integrity. In fact, there, it, there's a phrase that says watching you. The, the Greek translation there, what it should literally say is eye service. He's like, don't just work when your boss is around because your boss will see you and think you're doing good work. He says, hey, the work that you do, whether your boss is looking or not, you should, you should give it everything that you have. And, and by the way, what you really need to know is that you have an ultimate boss. And that ultimate boss for you is God, that God is watching you. That even when other people aren't watching you, God is watching you. And so we should have this healthy fear of God when it comes to the work that we do. But then Paul writes this in verse 23. And this is um, our main verse for the day. It's a theme verse throughout this series. Paul says, work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Kind of break this down into two parts. The first part is Paul says, work willingly. Now, some translations put it this way. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. This means whether you like your job or not, give it everything you have. Whether you, you like the people you work with or not, give it everything you have. It, it, whether you like your boss or not, or the people on your team, or the hours that you have, Paul says, give it all that you have. Work willingly with all your heart. Especially, especially when no one is looking. But then there's a second piece to this passage. Paul says, work for God and not for people. There's actually a question in there for us to answer. And the question is, who do we work for? Do, do we work for our boss? Do we work for a company? Do we work for an organization? Do we work for ourselves? Or do we really see the bigger picture that's here? That we are called to work for God. No matter what we think about the work we do and the people around us, we are called to work for God. So are you and I, are we working for God or are we working for someone else? And as we think about that and as we read this passage here in chapter 3, verse 23 of Colossians, what would it look like if you and I worked this way, that we, we worked willingly? We worked willingly with all of our heart that, that we began to see our work not just as something as we're trying to please other people, but that we're working because we want to fully please God. How, how would that change the work that we do? How would that change our, our feelings about work? How would that change our attitude about work? If it wasn't about us trying to live out these different views that we have about work, but, but man, we just understood who God was and that our work matters to God, and so our work should matter to us. It could be, though, we need to go a little step further. In fact, step back. Because I think sometimes we can talk about this and we think this sounds great, but, but uh, what does this really mean for me? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are called to something higher than most people, than other people are called to. That when it comes to our work worlds, um, we are called to live out this faith that we have where we work. One of Jesus' disciples is a guy named Peter, and uh, you may be familiar with Peter. He actually uh, writes um, a few letters to churches. We have two of those, First Peter and Second Peter. And uh, I love what, what Peter reminds the reader of in First Peter chapter 2, because I believe it's something we can sometimes forget and especially when it comes to our work world, that we can put it into practice. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter writes this. He says, But you are not like that, for you are chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Peter writes these letters to churches in Asia Minor. It's a group of churches, which is present-day Turkey. And as we see this piece here in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, he, he's really writing to two different groups of people. He's writing to Greek Christians and he's writing to Jewish Christians. 
Now, both sets here would have understood or been familiar with that term priest or, or priesthood. For the Greek Christians, uh, their, their connection to this was they lived in a society where there were priests, but the priest's job was to reflect the values of the kings, to reflect the values of the rulers of, of that day. And so they would live their lives in such a way to, to teach people in their society, in their culture, like, hey, this is the value of the king, and so you need to live this out in your life. Part of this is trying to make society better. better. Another part is trying to get them to conform to the values and ideas of the ruler. So when Peter talks about priests here, they know exactly what, what, he's, what, what Peter's talking about. Now, when it came to Jewish Christians, we're talking about a different group, right? These were people who were Jewish in their background. Many of them were still practicing some parts of their Jewish faith, but, but they had really become followers of Christ. And that was their overall, overarching um, faith. They were following Jesus. They were trying to be a better follower of Jesus. Again, it was still some connections to their, to their past. Well, Peter here uses some imagery that they would have been familiar with. And if you go back and you look at some of the passage here, Peter writes about the temple. He writes about sacrifices. He writes about, of course, this term priest. And they would have fully understood that. They would have known what Peter was talking about when he talks about this priesthood. Now for them, all of that was connected because the priests were the people you would go to because they were your middle, middle man between you and God, right? And so you would go to these priests to, to be the people that would give the sacrifices, that would be at the temple. And if you wanted to connect with God, you had to do it through them. But here's Peter, he says, because of Jesus, you don't have to do that anymore. That you are a priest yourself. And so if we look at these two groups of people that Peter is writing to, he really is redefining the role of priest that they were familiar with. On the one hand, Peter was saying, as a part of this priesthood, you don't need to go to the, the temple to engage with God. You don't need someone else to help you engage with God. You are fully connected to God because of Jesus. But he's also saying, as part of this priesthood, your role is to engage in society. That now you are a representative of the king, and that is, is Jesus, and you need to live your life representing the values of that king in society. And so here is, is Peter saying, hey, look, you have this responsibility that if you are a follower of Christ, this is who you are now. now why is this important? Look at the last part of verse 9. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and two is wonderful light. Peter is telling this group of people, said, you are changed. Like you got to experience this incredible blessing. At one point in time, you, you lived in darkness and then you met Jesus. And then your life was changed and, and now you're living in this incredible light. And oh, by the way, because you're in this place now and because you have been blessed, here's what God wants to do with you. God wants to use you in ways to bless other people. God wants to use you to help others come out of their own darkness so they can know the same light that you know now. Why or what does this term priesthood mean for us today then? Well, first, you don't need me. Uh, you don't need a pastor. You don't need a church official to connect you with God. Like, if you're connected to Jesus, you have got everything you need right there. But then the other aspect of this title of priest is that our job is to engage with society. That we are called to be a representative of Jesus in the world that we live in. And that is in all areas of our life. Our relationships, our families, our hobbies. When we go out to eat, when we're in school, when we're sightseeing in D.C., if we follow Jesus, no matter where we are, what we are doing, we represent Jesus to the world. If we think about what we read there in Colossians, if we think about what we've just read here in 1 Peter, how, how do these two things intersect for us? Well, first, our work matters to God. And secondly, we are called to represent Jesus. 
And to put that kind of simply, that would mean that no matter what we do, that our work reflects Jesus to our world. How hard you work, how you interact at work, how you react at work, all those things reflect Jesus to the world. Your ethics at work, your emotions at work, your attitude at work all reflect Jesus to the world. The words you say, the language you use, the body language you use, the faces you make when certain people talk in a meeting, all of those things reflect Jesus to the world. Who we are in every area of life, but as we're talking about here, about here in this series at work, reflects Jesus to our world. And I know we can sit here right now, we can hear all this, and like, this is great. Like, this is wonderful. You know, tomorrow morning, when I get to my office, I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to be a changed person. It's going to be so great. And so you get up tomorrow morning, and you're ready to go, and you walk into the office, and the project's not finished. And that person didn't do anything to the spreadsheet that they were supposed to do. And someone is sick again, and someone else is, or you're, you're a teacher, and... <laughs> That kid that they told you wasn't going to be back in your class this year is back in your class. And what happens in those moments? We forget about the priesthood, don't we? We forget about working for God, and in those moments, we lose it. Here's a reminder for you that when you're berating someone under you, you're reflecting Jesus to them. When you're angry at every little thing that doesn't go your way, you're reflecting Jesus to them. When you're talking to a group of people and you're sharing rumors that you've heard from someone else about someone else on your team, hey, you know what you're doing? You're reflecting Jesus to them. When you're talking to a group of people and you're complaining about your, your wife, your husband, your spouse, your, your kids, your family, you are re reflecting Jesus to them. And guess what? The reality is we're not reflecting Jesus. We're reflecting what's deep inside of us. We're, we're reflecting the darkness that sits deep inside of us. And we're really reflecting ourselves. But the tension is, sometimes those people know about our faith. They know about what's important to us. And all that we're really doing is reflecting ourselves for them. Guess who we're reflecting? We're reflecting Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're called to something bigger. We're called to represent the values and ideas of Jesus into our world. We're called to be a priest in our world, which means we are called to reflect Jesus to our world. With these ideas in mind and these scriptures that we've looked at today, let me leave you with three questions that I think are so important for us to answer. The first question is this, does Jesus matter to your work? Whatever the work is that, that you do, does Jesus matter to your work? Are you being a priest where you work? Are you being a representative of the values of Jesus to the people you work with? Or are you more focused on yourself? Or are you most, most, more focused on paying the bills or success or your identity or this, this purpose? Are, are, you, are you more focused on your retirement or a promotion or a pay increase? Is that what's most important to you? Or in the end, are you really truly focused on Jesus? And again, whatever that work may be for you. Does Jesus matter to your work? Question number two is how are you reflecting Jesus to others? I think it's a really important question for us to answer because it has incredible consequences. If we go back to 1 Peter, Peter's like, hey, you were in the darkness, now you came out of the darkness, and now you're living in the light, and because of that, you have an opportunity to influence other people's lives. Well, what do people see when they see you at work? What do they see in you? What are you reflecting? Are you reflecting Jesus truly, or are you reflecting what's deep down in, inside of you? Because here's the deal, when you hate your work, and you hate your boss, and you hate the people that you work with, I'm pretty sure you're not going to reflect Jesus in your workspace. You and I will reflect something else. And, and Peter's like, but that's not the way God works. God wants to bless other people. And that can happen when you are truly a reflection 
of who Jesus is. How are you reflecting Jesus at work? And the last question I would say is, what is a story you want to tell your life or your life to tell? Um, I, I know that uh, there's going to be a day, hopefully not soon at all, but um, I'm going to step off this stage and my life as a pastor, my role as a pastor is going to be over with. And um, man, that's been my identity for, for decades. But in the end, the question is, what will I be known for? Someday you're going to walk out of that office, you're going to walk off of that base, you're going to walk out of that school, that warehouse, your home, whatever it may be, and, and you're going to be done with the work that you've been doing. And on that day, when you step out of, of that place that has been your identity for years, what will you be known for? Did your work tell your story or did your faith tell your story? Were you a priest where you worked or were you just another disgruntled employee? In the end, people are not going to remember our work. We know this, right? They're not going to remember our accomplishments. They're not going to remember our promotions, our titles, our pay raises, the awards we got. They're not going to remember any of that. What they're going to remember is how you treated them and how you invested in them, how you loved for them and cared for them and helped them and encouraged them. And look, some of those people need to be fired and not be on your team anymore. I get it. And that's okay. But did they see something different in you, even in that moment where maybe you've got to let them go? That they knew they were cared for and loved for and encouraged. Is that the story you want to tell? Or is the story of yourself that you want to tell? What's the story you want your life to tell when it comes to your work? As we kind of think through those three questions there, and hopefully as you wrestle with those, you know, whatever your work may be, it takes me back about 200 years. There's a guy named William Wilberforce, and he put a, helped put an end to the British slave trade. He uh, was very wealthy. Uh, part of the political elite of the day and as you can imagine with these things in his life was like I don't need God I don't need Jesus at all but there's some people that that influenced him and and really changed his his life uh, one of these people was Isaac Milner Isaac Milner became a follower of of Jesus and uh, began investing time into Wilberforce and um, Wilberforce noticed that that Milner was different and changing and was talking to him and Milner's telling him about his faith and how he had become this different person. And, and Milner's influence on Wilberforce got Wilberforce to this place where he finally became a follower of Christ. Now, when he became a follower of Christ, he said, well, being a Christian and, and politics, that doesn't mix at all, right? So um, anyway, it's probably another whole story there. But um, but he was like, I can't do this anymore. I got to get out of this. I, I, I need to be a professional Christian, which meant for him he wanted to go and, and be in ministry. This guy named John Newton was a former slave ship captain, and he had become a pastor. And he got connected with Wilberforce, and they began to talk. And he, he told Wilberforce, he's like, hey, I just want you to know it's not God's will for you to go into ministry. You know what God's will for you is? To stay in politics. He's like, we need you there. And because of the influence of Milner and, Wilber, uh, and, and uh, Newton and how God had worked in Wilberforce's life in such a way that he came out of that darkness into the light, God used Wilberforce in amazing ways. And like I said, he helped put an end to the British slave trade. Think about all these things we've been talking about today, the Colossians and, and what we read in, in First Peter and and how God can work in these amazing, incredible ways. And sometimes we don't even know it. And I look at someone like Wilberforce and I think to myself, well, that's exactly what God does. God brought light into other people's lives. And they lived them, their lives in such a way that they were this incredible reflection of Jesus. And because of that influence, other people's lives were changed. One of those people being William Wilberforce. And through him, God blessed him and so many lives through that. Your work matters to God. 
And if God matters to you, then you will be a reflection of Jesus at work, at home, in your neighborhood, at kids' activities, in our world. That you and I will be priests and reflective of the values of Jesus right where we are, right where, where God has put us to be. We go back to that passage. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So my challenge for you over the next four weeks as we go through this series, take that passage, write it down somewhere, put it on your phone, and when you get up in the morning, read it, say it, pray it. When you, when you get to work and you're sitting there tomorrow morning and you're trying to be different and change, but you know that project's not done, that spreadsheet's not finished, and you want to go in and go off on someone, take this passage, read it, say it, and pray it. And at that moment in that meeting where you're ready to unleash, maybe you're like, time out, give me one second, read it to yourself, say it, and pray it. I think if we began to do that, we would see a change in ourselves. And in that change, God would use us in amazing ways in our life, but especially where we work.